Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Teaching with Madly Learning. Today, we are doing something a little bit different, and I have gone back into some of the archives of Teaching with Madly Learning, and I wanted to put together some five important tips that I think we can use to remind ourselves about all things teaching in the junior grades. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Patty, and I am a teacher here in Ontario, Canada, and every Monday night, we have a new video that comes out all about teaching in the junior grades, whether we are talking about inquiry, assessment, language arts, differentiation, split grade instruction, all of the things in between. We've got you covered in these videos. And it is my hope that through these videos that we can help to make teaching fun and engaging for both you and your students. So I want you to sit back and enjoy some previously aired, some of my favorite tips for teaching. Number one, listen more than you talk. So we've talked about that a couple of times in a lot of the videos coming up here that a lot of inquiry is about letting the student's voice take center stage and listening more for yourself. So listening to student interests, listening to their voice, letting them have a say, letting them have a stake in what they're learning, letting them decide where they want their learning to go and what their learning is going to look like. So the challenge for you is to listen more than you talk. And if you're like me, that essentially means that you have to almost physically close your mouth and stop talking. That's my challenge is I have to Tell myself in my head, don't answer, don't answer, don't answer, don't talk, don't talk, don't talk. Let them figure it out. Let them work through that problem. Ask them questions, probe them, guide them through that questioning, but to not jump in and give them the answers. What do you do to get kids talking more in your classroom? So... If you've ever had that moment where you ask one of those questions and you hear crickets chirping in your room, yet you thought you had a pretty chatty class, but when it comes to actually participating in conversations to talk about what they're supposed to be talking about as opposed to what happened on the playground earlier, you may find that all of a sudden there is not a whole heck of a lot of talking going on or that it might just be the same hands going up all of the time. I know that definitely happens with me and my class. So I think that's definitely really important and is making sure that when you are expecting your students to have a conversation that you give them a little bit of lead time and let them know what they're that conversation is about and giving them that time to think, especially if you're wanting them to think a little bit deeper. You want to give them that time to think. Now, this is even more important. If you've got happen to have students that have working memory issues, I know that's my number one issue that I often have in my classes, students that have working memory problems, meaning that they can't retain the information that they need to be using and processing on demand. So they definitely need that pause and that thinking time. So I've put up in my resource library, and we've talked about it before, about wonder doodle notes and just allowing students to write down what they're thinking, giving them time to think, giving them the questions before it happens, before you call them to the carpet, give them the questions, give them a journal to write in or a reflection to do before the discussion has even happened so that they have something to talk about. If you're doing an inquiry cycle, starting off a lot of your lessons reflecting on what you did your previous time with them is great because they will probably have some resources or some understanding of what they did last time and then they can talk about it a little bit more confidently. And one of the easiest ways that you can probably get kids talking is you can just simply have your class list and you can just go down and just call out students. I would caution you against that. If you are, like many of our students, that is extremely terrifying to a lot of kids, especially if they're not sure of the answer, and you may just be damaging that goal of creating that community and that trust between you and your students. So although you can do that, I would caution you against just calling students out and saying, okay, now it's your turn to answer the question. Every once in a while, you may want to do that depending on the circumstances, but I don't think as a rule that that's necessarily the most effective way to build communication skills in your class. So to address those working memory problems, I think it's really important that you give them that pause time, you front load what those questions are going to be, and you give them time to think. 
One of the things, too, is the idea of independent work skills. So I think this is a big one. This is often one I get a lot of in questions about how you do things if your students aren't independent. So I really think that it's important for us to understand that independent work skills, although some students may have independent work skills and they just might be really good at it, independent work skills is something that can be taught. Almost every student, I say almost because there are those few that just are not capable of it, but those are a smaller percentage than you would believe. Most students are able to be independent workers. However, this is where we can tie in that inquiry. It's really easy if you've got kids at home, if you've ever put them in front of a video game, you understand how well they can sit and focus on something that is important to them. When they're engaged and when they have a lot of buy-in into that activity, they can sit and be focused and work on that for the longest time ever. My daughter last week has homework where she has to write sentences every night. Well, this is really difficult and we fight with her to get this done. However, on the days that she's done that and doesn't have homework, she turns and starts writing sentences. She makes her own little booklets and starts writing her own sentences that are probably of the same quality. One is something she's forced to do. One is something she has chosen to do. And she will still use some of the words, but it just feels different for her. And I think that's something that we need to focus on is sometimes it's not the lack of independent work skills that they have, but it might be the tasks that we're asking them to do. If we look at independent work skills are easily accomplished when the students are engaged, when the task is appropriate for their independent work level, and there's something they had buy-in into, then I find independent work is a little bit easier. So for language and writing, I use a lot of inquiry practices for language, and I get a ton of student buy-in, and they're really successful at being able to work independently for sometimes up to 45 minutes. And this includes my special education students. When kids are given a choice and they're told, I need you to write something, the one thing they're able to do is they can automatically work at what they are capable of at their independent level. Now, that might not be where you need them to be, but that becomes where it's part of our job as teachers to recognize where they currently are independently and how we can move them forward through conferencing, through guided instruction, through modeled and shared lessons to get them further so that they can increase the complexity of what they are able to do independently. So they might only be able to write a story using a scaffolded organizer independently then there's next steps that you can build into that that gets them to move a little bit further. But that student chose that story. He chose what he wanted to write about. Probably Minecraft is a popular one or some video game character is the hero of his own personal story. But that student has picked the character. They've picked the story that they're going to write. It's completely theirs. They've designed it. They're invested in those characters. Those characters are meaningful for them. So that buy-in and engagement is high. And therefore, they're able to sustain their attention on that activity for a lot longer, which gives you more time to work with guided groups or conferencing with others. When their independent activities are appropriate for what they're able to do, and they have a high level of engagement and buy-in and choice in what they're doing, then they'll more successfully be able to sustain their independent work skills for a lot longer. I think that it is so important to address the students' special education needs in a real authentic and meaningful way so that you can help them grow and learn and not only meet their needs, but meet the needs of everybody else. My first one is that no one is excluded from the learning. So this kind of started for me when I worked as an ESL teacher in a regular school, so I was helping other teachers in their classrooms with, with uh, ESL students. And often I would see sometimes there were students would be excluded. So they'd be put maybe on a computer to work while the teacher taught 
uh, the rest of the class. So part of my job was to help teachers to integrate these students in a more authentic way into their classroom. And this is kind of what cemented for me why the rule is that no one is excluded from learning and everyone is included in the classroom. So this does take a little bit of a stretch from the teacher because there are times where, granted, it's probably easier to put them on the computer or give them an independent task while you perhaps teach something that might be a little bit beyond where they might be working at at that point in time. But I think for me, it's really important for me to build a sense of community in my classroom and to make sure that everyone feels a part of the community and the system, and that includes even the most vulnerable students. So even though they might not be able to access everything about the lesson, I want to make sure that there's at least some entry point or some way that they can participate into the lesson and that they are always included in what is happening in learning how to build a community so that students do feel as though they are comfortable enough to take risks in the classroom, they're comfortable enough to fail and understand that your place is a safe place for them to experience failure and know that they can rebound from that. They feel that they can share their ideas, that it's safe to do so, and that they can trust you and their classmates. And building a community to do this is a great way and it definitely helps to establish a foundation or inquiry that often involves students communicating with one another and sharing their ideas. I want to talk about building a community because it certainly is a focus for myself right now in my classroom. And I think that is definitely something that we need to be cognizant of when we are using inquiry in our classroom. Because you need to have students be able to share their ideas. But in order for them to share their ideas and so that you don't hear crickets in your classroom when you ask questions or get them to do something, there needs to be an establishment of trust. And unfortunately, in this day and age, many students that come into our classroom are having a difficult time with this ability to take risks, to not be perfect, to have the ambiguous answer. So they really want to get to the right answer and do it well. They're often afraid of failure and often maybe they are, especially when you're getting older grades and juniors, there is a lot of social risk that is involved in sharing their ideas, especially if their ideas are wrong. So building a community where it is safe and where you are helping students contract what it looks like to share within your classroom, I think is an essential skill to build up. And if you don't quite have that yet, it's never too late to start. I can do it in January and you can join me as well and do it with me. So I think the first step is always. So the next thing that you can do to help build a community of learners is really celebrating the process that is learning. So understanding that learning is a journey and being really explicit about growth mindset and what happens to your brain when you learn and how learning happens inside your brain and talking about the synapses, making connections when you join something new with something old and making those connections. Acknowledging for students that every single one of them has a different brain and might need to do different things in order to be successful and that you're there to support finding what it is that's going to make their brain learn the quickest as possible so that they can get that new concept I think is really important. And celebrating not always just achieving the end, but also celebrating that journey along the way. So some of the things to do is to not mark everything right away and instead focus really on feedback first and getting students to the point where they're not concerned that you're going to mark things and send it home right away. And then you're not expecting perfection in the beginning. I think celebrating and learning is really important and making it really explicit for your students. Another thing that's important when you are supporting building community in your classroom is to embrace failure or embrace mistakes depending on how you really want to use those words in your classroom. So making sure that you are explicit with your students to say you're giving them something new that you're not expecting them to get it right away. If you are expecting them they might not know what it is and that's totally fine and normal. Going back to the celebrating learning and going over how the brain works and how you learn Understanding that not doing well is okay. This also means as a teacher that you need to stop rescuing them and stop being a helicopter teacher. So we always hear about helicopter teacher or helicopter parents, but there's also the idea that you're saving them from making a bad decision. 
because you know, you might know what you think is going to happen at the end. So, oh, if Johnny works with Billy, they're going to be horrible partners and nothing's going to get done and it's just not going to work. So I think the valuable lesson there is if we let Johnny and Billy be partners and nothing gets done, then they fail to complete that assignment. If they then have to explain why that didn't get done, you help them realize and come to the realization that one of the reasons that they did fail and they didn't get something done was because they struggled with working together and really getting them to think about whether or not that was the best decision. That's a real valuable learning tool, especially when you're wanting them to be critical and reflective of what kind of environment they need to be, they need to be successful in. So if we're constantly rescuing them from themselves, then they're not learning from that really beneficial piece of failure. That that's often for many of us the biggest thing that helps us to make real jumps. If we go back, we think about what it is that we failed or what we didn't succeed at, that's probably going to be meant for many of us the thing that really was a pivotal point for us. So I think it's okay to not always rescue your students and allow them to learn from their own mistakes and learn from their own failures. Now, of course, these are going to be those small failures and the ones that don't have big risk or big stakes. In them. So we're not going to let them obviously fail on assignments and tests. But if it's a matter of someone like a partner or maybe not getting their first draft done in the, by the deadline, those aren't going to be make it or break type of opportunities. They are going to be learning opportunities. So it's okay if we let them fail just a little bit there. Another thing I think you should avoid when you're teaching a split grade class is to treat your class like they're two separate groups. So I think that it's really important that as a teacher, we when we have a classroom, that we treat our kids like they are all part of one big classroom. They may be assigned to two different grades, but they are all in the same room. So trying as much as possible to treat them like a whole group as opposed to a group of fives and a group of fours. Some of the ways that you can do that is by mixing them up in their seating assignments to make sure that you don't have the five separate from the fours or whatever your grade split might be, is that you try to group them amongst one another so that you can have the strength of that older grade or even maybe some of the curiosity of that younger grade can work together and that you can allow groups and partnerships to work cross grade that they're not always doing separate activities. So another thing I think that sometimes people get stuck on is getting hyper focused on the details. So when you have a split, you get hyper focused on looking at how many expectations you have to cover and thinking about and just getting really overwhelmed with all of those small little details and thinking about your checklist being doubled. Instead of focusing on the commonalities and the big ideas of the curriculum as it's combined. So if you focus less on those specific details and you're focusing more on the big ideas, is understanding that those when those are written, those specific details are designed to cover that big idea. So when you cover that big idea, you're probably going to also be covering those specifics along the way. Understanding too that learning is on a continuum and that all of your students aren't necessarily, just because they're assigned to that grade, aren't necessarily only allowed to learn within those parameters and boxes that it's okay if there is some review and there's okay if there's some extension in there. If the students are ready for it, why not expose them to that review as well as to some extension as well? And that's good for, I think, all students to do. So there you have it. Those are just some of the tips from previously aired videos that I wanted to share with you once again. So I hope that they have given you some ideas and inspiration that you can take back into the classroom for the remainder of this week and this year. So I hope you've enjoyed reaching back into the archives of the Teaching with Madly Learning show. It has been three years so far that we have been putting out a video every Monday night, and even the things that we talked about three years ago are still relevant today. So I'm glad I was able to find some of my favorite tips and tricks to share with you that I have talked about over the years. I hope it is giving you some ideas and inspiration that you can take back into the classroom. Thank you so much for joining me, and we will see you next Monday night. Bye for now.